The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents No Neutrality, where we have a roundtable of contributors pushing the antithesis in every area of life. From family to government, apologetics to homeschooling, being a wife and a mother, a husband, a father, single, widow, business owner or employee, you will hear commentary, essays, lectures, blogs, and battle plans on how to bring forth the Christian worldview to all of life. This is a Reconstructionist Radio production. The following audio blogs can be found in written form at foundationsofreconstruction.com and have been produced into audio format by its authors. This audio blog titled, Femininity and the Christian Woman, was written and recorded by Jessica Lambert on September 23, 2016. The creation of woman was not an afterthought. The man was designed and created physically, emotionally, socially, and spiritually with her coming creation both planned and assured. Femininity is a reality of God's incredibly miraculous design. It is his precious, priceless gift to every woman, and in a different way, his gracious gift to men as well. The difference between man and woman is more than just a matter of biology. It is much more than that. Throughout human history, people have just taken for granted that the difference was so obvious that there was absolutely no reason to comment on it. Never before have we needed so much the reminder Paul gives to the Roman Christians about not allowing the world to squeeze us into its mold but to let God remold our minds and our hearts from within ourselves. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect tool of God. Romans 12.2 Dying to self and surrendering plays a key role in femininity. As a bride, a woman surrenders not only her independence, but her name, her home, her destiny, her will, and her body to the bridegroom. As a mother, she surrenders her time, and in a very real sense, her life for the life of her child or children. As a single woman, she surrenders herself in a very unique and otherwise impossible way to the service of the Lord, her family, and her community. Femininity is a beautiful thing. The gentle and quiet spirit that Peter refers to in 1 Peter 3-4 is the ornament of femininity. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. 1 Peter 3-4 We can see this in Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was willing to give herself up as a vessel, to be unknown, to be hidden, she faced contempt for being a child and unmarried, and yet bore it all with a patient, willing spirit. This femininity is available to every woman who humbles herself before the Lord and follows his law, and it is a precious treasure, a priceless thing to be guarded. Proverbs 31 has a lot to say about the virtuous woman. Did you know that virtuous woman actually comes from a masculine noun that means strength, might, valor, and power? In our culture, it is a never-ending paddle to be separate from the world. We are constantly being told that we will never measure up. We will never make a difference. After all, we're just women. Instead of the world embracing biblical femininity, it fights against it. It wants women to be equal to man, but God didn't design it that way. Still, a woman does hold incredible power in her hands. The heroic femininity of a godly young woman is what makes her who she is. No person defines her limits. God alone empowers her to do great things and to do it in a feminine, pure, selfless, courageous, and amazing way. The femininity of a woman is the perfect complement to the masculinity of a man. It was the perfect design of a perfect creator. We should not hide our femininity, but embrace it. As women, we excel and blossom in relationship. In the garden, when Eve ate of the fruit and God placed a curse on her, it had everything to do with relationships, to her family, her children. I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing, and pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Genesis 3:16. Women are nurturers by nature. Our composition is that which breeds and nurtures life itself. A woman is not less feminine if she is unmarried, or married and unable to produce offspring. She is still a nurturer, and she will operate in that role whether or not it involves husband and children. In Isaiah, we see the nurturing nature of God. We, as women, reflect that image of him. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Isaiah 49, 15-16 as women, we reflect this heart of God in a way that men necessarily cannot do because they do not naturally have a tendency to nurture. It is our duty and should be our pleasure to be nurturing daughters, sisters, mothers, aunts, nieces, and wives. Here we come to another key element of femininity. A woman desires to be beautiful. She desires to be called beautiful. 
but we have to have a real understanding of beauty. Being outwardly attractive is not nearly as important as being inwardly beautiful. There is weight to the word beautiful, and it goes beneath the surface of a woman. It should describe the light that shines through her from within, the beauty that is made by the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, like we mentioned before, the willingness to help others, patience, a joyful spirit, kindness, love. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. 1 Peter 3, 3-5 through It is not suggesting that our desire to be beautiful is sinful, but that we should be far more concerned with how beautiful we are on the inside than the outside. Proverbs thirty one thirty says, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. We should never be so concerned with our outward appearance that we forget and neglect what is on the inside. Our true beauty should be imperishable, rooted in a deep love for our Lord God and in obedience to his law word. The femininity that we hold as women is not something to be ashamed of, but rather something to stand up for and defend. The world wants to make women masculine and feminine as men. They are in rebellion against God and his perfect plan as they fight against their God-given roles as man and woman. Now is the time to stand up and stand strong. Be a fearless, feminine woman who is the reflection of the woman in Proverbs. It seems like an impossible task, but the battle is already won. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now, there was a set of vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. John nineteen twenty eight through 30 Be free, be fearless, be feminine. In Christ, Jessica Lambert The following audio blog, titled, Of God and Governments, was written and recorded by Caleb Wallace on September 27, 2016. What is government? This is a seemingly simplistic question, but few people today can even begin to formulate a coherent answer. When you ask the average American what is government, their first thought is that thing in Washington, D.C. This answer is a startling revelation in terms of biblical thought. It represents a fundamental misunderstanding of the true nature of government, as ordained by God. The secularized mind thinks of governing institutions as necessarily political. This interpretation must be abandoned in favor of one of more biblically and historically sound nature. A fundamentally faulty understanding of government is propagated by the modern education systems of secular humanism. Such education has the effect of stripping government of its God-ordained meaning. This dramatic shift, however, has occurred rather unnoticed in a short time period. A generation ago, high school classes dealing with state government were given the title Civics. The topic of these classes would be the function of government in civil matters. Today, such classes are given the conveniently broad term government, implying that all governments are mystically absorbed into one all-encompassing government. Before the First World War, textbooks which dealt with national government were, as we saw, qualified with the word civil. According to the author of the 1903 textbook titled Elements of Civil Government, quote, The family is a form of government, established for the good of children themselves, and the first government that each of us must obey, end of quote, page 18. Furthermore, the textbook acknowledges five realms of civil government, which include, quote, the township slash district, village slash city, the county, the state, and the United States, end of quote. Also, page 18. The term government was thus, as older educational views reveal, much broader than the national government or even the civil government. These writers were aware that there were personal, family, church, and civil governments, each having a legitimate realm of authority. The state was simply one government among many. Noah Webster, in his 1828 dictionary, defines government in terms of personal self-control rather than the modern definition of a civil institution. But, 
In modern dictionaries, nowhere can self or family government be found. A popular modern dictionary, Webster's New World Dictionary, 1972, defines government this way, quote, The exercise of authority over a state, district, organization, or institution. End of quote. We herein see the fundamental problem. No Webster, in the older and more biblically based definition, includes family government as part of his definition before dealing with the government of a state or nation, i.e. civil government. He defines family government as, quote, the exercise of authority by a parent or householder. Children are often ruined by a neglect of government on the part of parents, end of quote. According to the scripture, it is the duty of parents to govern in the home. It is not the duty of the civil government to meddle in the affairs of family government. We can expect, however, that when parents neglect their God-given responsibility of the government of children, the state will assume an increasingly dominant role in the government of the family. Unless we break from the modern view of government as being somehow limited to the officials on Capitol Hill or the realm of civil government in general, our, our culture will continue to neglect the more basic and important forms of government. When we do not see our obligation to fulfill our God-given responsibilities in every area of government, they will be filled by the state. Due to this lack of responsibility, modern man looks progressively to the benevolence of the state for care and security. In a very real sense, the state becomes daddy. This is the ultimate breakup of biblical government. However, as long as men have no desire to fulfill their responsibility in terms of personal, family, and ecclesiastical government, they will reap the enslavement such reliance upon the state brings. As men move away from the faith, the state progressively replaces Christ as Messiah. All government necessarily de derives its meaning from God. It begins with the individual and extends outward to include all institutions. Because of the centrality of the individual, we must recognize the centrality of the regenerating work of Christ. As Dr. R. J. Rushton said, quote, There can be no good character in civil government if there is none in the people. You cannot make a good omelet with bad eggs. End of quote. In his three-part work, God and Government, Gary DeMar puts it this way, quote, If the heart is in rebellion against God, we can expect undisciplined and ungoverned people. If the heart has been made new by Christ, we can expect the people who will govern their lives according to the governing principles of Scripture. End of quote. If man will not exalt God's law as supreme in his own life, why should we expect him to do so in his family, church, or state? We can thus see the centrality of the two forms of government, self-government and family government. Without these two, the others cannot exist. Now let us turn our attention to ecclesiastical church government. Ecclesiastical government is very easy to pinpoint in scripture. Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 5.23 Ecclesiastical government is neither a pure democracy nor a monarchy. While it is up to the people of the congregation to choose their leaders, elders and deacons, once chosen, they assume a position of authority and obedience and honor to them is required. Quote, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch over your souls, as they that must give account, as they may do it with joy, and not with grief, for that, for that is unprofitable to you. Hebrews 13.17 Christ gives the example for how these ecclesiastical leaders should govern. They should not act as tyrants or establish autocratic systems. We should also note the intimacy these ecclesiastical governors should have. No church can be effectively shepherded from afar. Paul thus instructed Titus to, quote, appoint elders in every city, end of quote, Titus 1, 5. Each church was to have a biblically-based ecclesiastical government ruled and shepherded by qualified leaders, 1 Timothy 3, 1-15. When disputes arise among churches, representatives from the churches were to come and settle on doctrinal matters. Acts 15, 
through 35. From the Tower of Babel to the United Nations, God has always been opposed to centralization. God's judgment upon the Tower of Babel is because of the corruption inherent in its religious and political centralism. Quote, the symbolic purpose of the tower was to unify all creation under a centralized civil and ecclesiastical system. Corruption and tyranny would express itself in centralization. End of quote. The purpose of the tower was purely humanistic. Quote, Let us make for ourselves. End of quote. Genesis 11.4 Centralization is the basic expression of humanism. Biblical civil government is structured much like ecclesiastical government. Matters of the state can be best dealt with on a local level where the needs of the people of an individual community can be best known and met. Consolidation of power is thus limited. Civil governors, similar to ecclesiastical governors, find their head in Christ. Psalm 2 describes the fate of all government, and specifically here civil, which attempts to cast off the law word of God and assert its own autonomy. Quote, he shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The civil government cannot find its true purpose except in terms of God's law word. Romans 13, 1-7 gives us a concise definition of the role the civil government should fill. Quote, he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. End of quote. The role of the civil magistrate is thus strictly one of justice. The definition of evil and the punishment due for this evil can only be found in God's law. God's law is just. And thus, for the civil magistrate to act justly, he must follow God's law. As previously mentioned, when we see the civil government as the only legitimate government, the civil government must extend its jurisdiction beyond that of simply executing justice. If parents neglect the governing of their children and the raising them in the, quote, fear and admonition of the Lord, end of quote, the state will assume that responsibility. When the church neglects its duties of welfare for the elderly and provision for orphans and widows, the state will assume that responsibility. This is not biblical government. In conclusion, we must recognize the diverse forms of government ordained by God. God has ordained three institutions, family, church, and state, which all three have their own individual rounds of government. Chaos ensues when one institution attempts to extend its jurisdiction over any aspect of the others. We also must realize that neglect of responsibility in one necessarily leads to tyranny and usurpation by one or both of the others. Biblical government is decentralized and hinges upon self-government. No form of government can operate under God without the members thereof being under God. Sustainable societal change can only occur through personal regeneration. When we see the individual under God, we will necessarily see the individual's institutions also under God. We must not focus on any higher form of government to, to the neglect of the lower. How will America be restored to its biblical foundations? From the bottom up starting with the individual, then the family, next to the church, and lastly to the state. The foundations are, of Reconstruction are upon God's model of government. We must realize this and act accordingly. Until then, we will continue to experience tyranny and not realize true freedom under God and His law word. This audio blog, titled The Gift of Singleness, was written and recorded by Caitlin Smith on September 24, 2016. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, how she may be holy both in body and spirit, but she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 34 We all know and believe that God has given each of us a gift, something special, something unique, that enables us to become fully functional members of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 4 and 1 Corinthians 12 verse 12 Do we look at singleness as a gift? the time when we are of eligible age for marriage and there is no other person in that can marry, do we embrace it? Do we welcome it wholeheartedly? Oftentimes I hear a lot about the gift of marriage, the pleasures of having a best friend beside you, the joy of raising a family. Many times I have heard preached that marriage is a beautiful, tangible picture of Christ and his bride, the church. Ephesians 5, verse 25 through 27. 
We are conditioned to think in terms of marriage from a young age. From movies, books, and music, we all get the idea that guy plus girl equals extreme happiness. Even the youngest of those in our culture can testify to this. All you have to do is ask my four-year-old sister. And it is this thinking that leads to discontentment during the single years of life. But what about those single years? That time when you are 20-something, desiring marriage, and there is no spouse in sight. What happens when you find yourself getting older, and you still haven't found the one for you? What then? I would say that nearly all of us have been given the gift of singleness for a short season of time at least. I know very few people who have married immediately after their schooling, and I know very few people who have never married. For most of us, it seems that we finish our formal education, and they kind of just drift around, waiting the long days of drudgery until that special someone comes and finds us, giving us purpose and vision for our lives. But are they really long days of drudgery? Shouldn't we treasure these years that we have been given just as much as we will our marriage years? These years that, for many of us, will be a thing of the past all too soon. What are we doing with them? First Corinthians says that the unmarried cares for the things of the Lord. First Corinthians 7, verse 34. Are you pursuing the things of God with these years, or are you mindlessly living? The most encouraging thing I think I have ever heard regarding singleness was from a well-known preacher a few years ago. He said that while marriage represented a picture of Christ in his relationship to the church, singleness represented a picture of heaven, where there will be no marriage. Matthew 22, verse 30. Only utter devotion to God. Colossians 3, verse 1. Praising him constantly. Psalm 95, verses 1 through 11. Serving him willingly and diligently. Matthew 25, verses 35 through 40. How does this represent singleness? Because we are in a season in our lives where we can serve God as hindered. Hebrews 12, verse 28. We have a flexibility that our married brothers and sisters don't have. They have responsibilities. The care of the house. The care of the family. We single people don't. We are free to serve God at any time, day or night. And what made this remark so encouraging is that it was a man who, yes, is married now, but he was single until he was 30-something years old. He would definitely know all the feelings and emotions and discontent that comes with that. This isn't to say that we will always be content to serve God, never thinking about marriage, and that some days won't be excruciatingly painful, emotionally stressing, and with a constant struggle for joy. But we need to understand that God has a plan. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. He has something he wants to teach us, and we will be pliable. Psalm 119, verse 27. He knows where he is leading us, and it is up to us to follow him. Psalm 119, verse 35. So many bad things happen, and so many lives are scarred when we try to fix our singleness, when we run ahead of the direction he has given to us. We need to learn to wait on him, to trust him. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Are we redeeming the time of our days? Ephesians 5, verse 16. What is there for us to do until God reveals the next part of our lives to us? Where do we fit into this world? If our purpose in life is to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever, how can we best do that with these years of singleness He has given? In our family, we daughters stay at home under our Father's protection until we marry, should the Lord call us to marriage. I have had a friend question this choice to remain under my father, saying that life won't just come knocking on the door, and we have to pursue it. She was speaking about college, a career, and meeting a man. I didn't understand that statement for a long while, but I eventually came to realize that she has seen so many young people who stay at home. Maybe they even have a job, but they aren't doing anything. Their whole lives consist of playing games, eating, sleeping, going to their job, and doing it all over again. Where is the purpose to our days? What motivates us to get up in the morning? Is it because we have plans with friends, or because we are engaged in a kingdom of work? Instead of just going through the motions of your days, I challenge you to find a purpose and go after it. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Yes, even in your single years, these years where we have so much stamina can get up and go on only a few hours worth of sleep. We can be more active. Engage life. Prepare for marriage if you feel that God has called you to that, but don't fear singleness. Embrace it with a fervor. The longer you are single, the longer you have to wholeheartedly give your life to service with the goal of allowing the Lord's glory to shine through. First Chronicles 16, verse 24. I have found that the busier I am, the less time I have to pine away waiting. We must choose joy. It's not enough to just wish for contentment. We must pursue it. And we, as believers, can only be truly content following in the steps of Christ. First Peter 2, verse 21. Practically speaking, I am 20. Yes, I have a desire to marry and bear children of my own, and I would excitedly jump at the chance to marry tomorrow if that was the Lord's will for my life. 
but I am also the oldest child in a family of 11 children. During this season of my life, when I have so many little siblings in so many different stages of development, I would miss so much of their lives. I would have a totally different way of relating to them than I would to the siblings who I have spent so many years of my life with. So while I'm excited to see what the Lord has in store in this area of the South, it is easier to wait on his timing knowing it will be perfect. I would miss teaching a little brother to read and the excitement when he reads his first book by himself and the excitement as he reads his second first book. I would never see the forts my little brothers built or be able to stop what I am doing when they come to get me and see the Jamestown they have created in our living room using Lincoln logs and blocks, Legos, and Indian and Sedmore figures. I would never hear them processing what they have learned and what could be hilarious conversations. I never hear a little brother I am teaching math to explain the concept to an even younger sister, receiving the affirmation that he did indeed understand everything I said and I wasn't just speaking to the air. No. I am not always content. I struggle. I have cried tears. I have wondered and questioned. And it's in those days of struggle and heartache that I learn the most. When I have washed loads of dishes with no end in sight. When I have food in the oven and don't hear the timer for the get cheap time that week. When I have washed loads of laundry and there is still more. When I have ironed a mountain of clothes and have yet more to go. When I change one diaper and immediately need to go through the process again. But everything I have done seems to come out all wrong, and nothing I do will make it right. But these are the days of weariness that lead to peace. These are the days when I am growing the most, learning the most. When I have to say I'm sorry, when I have to forgive it. When I realize that real life is never a picture-perfect fairy tale, but I cannot rely upon myself for the answers. I have discovered many ways to keep my days full. I have the opportunity to do many things that will not be practical when I have children of my own. My pastor asked me last year to start a choir for the children in our church, and that involves time to plan, search out songs, arrange parts to my liking. Time I will not have when I am married, because it will then be devoted to other duties. I have had the opportunity to make hundreds, if not thousands, of phone calls this past year to probate judges, homeschool organizations, churches, state representatives, and private schools looking for attendees to rally, support for several pro-life bills, and Alabamians willing to take a stand against gay marriage. I would not have had the hours to devote to this if I were a married woman running my own household. I have time now to research, write for this website, write for my own blog. I have time to study areas I am interested in. I have been able to help my pastor to inscribe an old English volume of commentary into modern English and spelling, and learning much from our church fathers as I went along. Time to gain a deeper understanding of scripture, to help widows, and to cook for others. I have the freedom and ability to order my days as I need to for each task that comes up. And I embrace that freedom just as much as I will embrace marriage if it ever comes into my life. So, what if it appears you will always be single? Think of the good your life can be for spreading the gospel to others. Continue on in the path you have trod. Don't become discouraged and search out ways to serve others. Look to others who have gone before you. Glean from them. Study their lives. Make a choice to conscientiously pursue joy. Philippians 4, verses 4, and 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16. Choose contentment, First Timothy 6, verse 6. Take the opportunity to become all that our Creator has intended us to become. We must learn to live life to its fullest extent, in Christ. Joyfully participate in life by following the Lord's path. We must go the way that He, in His infinite wisdom, is leading us. Because that is the only way that we get any fulfillment or joy in life. He has placed us where He has us for a reason, and we are to trust Him, lean on Him, and follow where He guides. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. We need to realize that we are an intricate part of God's wonderful plan he has for this world. This is true regardless of whether we marry or not. It might be a small part to play, but if we didn't do it, if we didn't fill the place he created that is just our size, then something would be lacking in this world of ours. We need to aim to make our life count for something to the glory of God. We need to live in our God-given sphere so that others may see us serving God. We need to live in such a manner and have a heart so devoted to God that our Father in heaven will say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of the Lord. Matthew 25, verse 23. Thank you for listening to this episode of No Neutrality on the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network. Don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to download your favorite audiobooks and podcasts. And if you are a Christian Reconstructionist blogger, 
and you'd like to contribute your blogs into this audio blog format, click on the volunteer link on our website, send us an email, and let us know you'd like to join the team. May Christ be glorified and His kingdom extended from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.